But hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm Tracy Nguyen, the Youth Engagement Project Coordinator at the California School-Based Health Alliance, otherwise abbreviated as CSHA. Welcome to our youth-only webinar on birth control and emergency contraceptives, the basics. Um, this is the first of two youth-only webinar we are hosting for this academic year. Please be on the lookout for our second youth-only webinar um, sometime soon. Um, information is still be determined, but otherwise than that, we can go ahead and get into this. Oh, let me go ahead and click that. Okay, cool. Just some general housekeeping, but this webinar will be recorded. So, um, the recording will be um, the recording and the slides today will be sent to all our attendees as well as registrants who couldn't come today. Um, and so please be on the lookout for those emails. But also I wanted to let everyone know that just because um, this webinar is recorded, you don't have to worry about the group chat. The group chat messages will not be recorded. So feel free to say hi to each other, to ask your questions in the group chat and to just hype it up. You know, we really love it when um, our participants are engaged um, in our presentation. Um, with that, um, feel free to you know, put your questions in the group chat. If you're comfortable with that, if you want to remain anonymous, feel free to change the two in the area where you can um, send your questions or type in any messages instead of to everyone, you can click on everyone and a drop down menu will appear. And that's where you can click on host and panelist if you wanna ask your questions privately. We won't call out any names, so please don't worry about that. Everything will remain as anonymous as, as much as possible, basically. So if you have any questions, feel free to put in the group chat uh, to the host and panelists if you would like, and then we'll answer your questions towards the end of the uh, presentation. See, up next, I wanna talk a little bit about um, my organization, the California School-Based Health Alliance. Some of you may know about it, some of you may not. So just really quickly, the California School-Based Health Alliance is a statewide nonprofit organization. Um, it's dedicated to improving the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing health services in school. And the main thing that we do for youth in particular is youth development. And under that umbrella, we have the youth health worker curriculum. That's really a peer resource meant to help youth learn more about different health topics and also give youth a deeper dive into the different health professions um, that you may not know, have known about. The other thing that we do under the youth development umbrella is we have our very own youth board. So our youth board consists of college age youth who promote um, youth engagement at school-based health centers um, through leadership, advocacy, and networking opportunities. So those are the main things that we do under youth development. And there's also plenty of resources geared towards youth for youth on our website as well. I'll make sure to link that in the group chat once I get the chance to. But some of these resources include sexual reproductive health, substance use, behavioral health, COVID-19, and anti-racism, just to name a few. Um, but that's basically the gist of our organization. If you have any questions about it, please let me know. I'll be happy to answer them um, once I get the chance to in the group chat. And with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on over to Dr. Teresa Lopez de Peda, um, and she will be our presenter for today. Please go ahead, Teresa. Hi everyone, um, my name is um, Dr. Teresa Lopez de I'm a nurse practitioner. I have been for the last 16 years now and I work and live in the Coachella Valley and I have only ever attended Coachella Fest one time and it was actually quite fun. I am married with three children, a 20 year old, a 17 year old, a six year old and I also have two furry babies. Um, Sophie, she's my older dog and she's about um, 12 now. And then I have Duke, he's my new baby. He's a schnauzer and I've had him, he's a little over a year now and he's pretty fun. Um, so I'll go ahead and um, share my slide. Or do you wanna go ahead and do that for me? I'm okay with that. If you wanna do the slides for me. Uh, yeah, I can totally do that if you want. Let me just sure, since pull. you already have it up. Let me go ahead and pull out real quick. Sorry. 
Sorry, everyone, just a moment. I'm opening it up right now and start show. Okay, cool. Let me go ahead and share screen. And such. Can you see my screen? We're good, everyone. I can see it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And so we can go to the first slide for this um, presentation. I'm just going to talk over um, in general. Um, the different contraceptive options. I've kind of categorized them for you. Um, long acting reversible contraceptives. We have IUDs and implants. We're gonna go over hormonal methods. And these are things that do have hormones in them. Um, we have um, IUDs, which are the intrauterine devices, implants, injections, or shots. Oral contraceptives are the pill, patches, rings, and then there's also non-hormonal, um, the barrier methods and fertility awareness as well. Um, so we'll talk about these um, briefly uh, for each category. So the first one is the long acting reversible contraceptive. In medical jargon, a lot of people or a lot of providers may refer to them as LARC. It's just an acronym for them. We have the intrauterine device. There is currently four on the market and one of them does have a generic option. So I'll start with the first one, the longest acting, which we call the copper IUD. Um, the copper IUD is non-hormonal. Um, it's good for up to 10 years. And um, this IUD is, um, it, it doesn't change your menstruation. It is inserted into the uterus uh, by a provider in an office. It's not a surgical procedure, but it is a procedure. Um, it doesn't change your menstruation. Um, and it generally just, uh, for some people, it'll make their periods a little bit heavy and longer. Um, for others, they may not see much of a change. Then we have hormone um, IUDs. And we have three of those. One of them does have a generic version. Um, there were two that were actually um, manufactured specifically for teens or young women that have not had children. And that's um, Skyla and Kylina. And then we also have the Mirena IUD. So um, the difference is um, those do have hormones. They usually make your periods shorter, lighter. And in some occasions, uh, some of them may um, stop your period, um, or, you know, you may skip it one year, I mean, one month, um, and then you may have it normally the next month. So in some occasions, you may not have a period every month. Another long-acting reversible contraceptive is the next Planon. I, I find that a lot of um, teenagers kind of like this. It's very easy to insert. Um, there is no maintenance. There's nothing you have to do. It just kind of sits there. Um, the insertion process is similar to that of an IV. You put a needle in, the little insert stays, and then you remove it. We do put local anesthetic just because the needle is a little bit larger or a little bit thicker than the needle. So you do get a little bit of local anesthetic. Um, this I, uh, this um, implant is good for three years. It is 99% effective as, um, as well as the IUDs. 22% um, of the women that use this method will not have a period. So approximately two out of 10 will not have a period. Now the other 80% or 78% have irregular periods. So everybody's body is slightly different. Some women may have you know, spotting for two weeks, and that's their period. Others may have spotting for three weeks, and then they don't have a period for four months. Uh, so it just varies a little bit. And then some people do have a normal period. However, in general, it does make your periods a little bit lighter um, when you do have a period, but it can be a little more prolonged than you're used to. Um, however, it is 99% effective it's easy to insert and it's easy to remove and there's usually no fuss with that one. 
Um, the next um, and the first of the hormonals that I'll go over, um, oh, sorry, it's not the first, um, is the injection, Depo-Provera injection, a lot, or the shot. Perhaps a lot of you have heard of it referred to as the shot. Depo-Provera is an injection you get every three months. Um, you just schedule your follow-up appointments with your provider. Um, and in some clinics, you'll see the provider and others. It'll just be a nurse visit. You go in, you get your injection. The first one, you do have a consult with the provider. Um, this one does tend to stop your menstruation. So for most women, once you start the injection, it usually stops your menstruation. It isn't uncommon for the first injection for you to have some irregular bleeding, and that is common when you start any birth control method. But usually by the second injection, you don't have a period anymore. There's also some women that, you know, a few weeks, a couple of weeks um, prior to the next dose, they may start to have a little bit of spotting or they may have a period. Rarely um, will anyone have a regular period on Depo-Provera. It does have an average weight gain of seven pounds per year. Not everybody gains it. Some people do. It's super important if you're on this injection, just if you do, you know, if you exercise, you watch your diet, um, it shouldn't be a problem. But for some women, they may notice that weight gain. And the next one is, um, the birth control pills. A lot of you have heard about the birth control pills. We have multiple brands, um, depending on your needs. There's different types of pills. You know, we use it for various reasons, not just for pregnancy prevention. You know, we put our teens on them for acne, for heavy menstruation, for menstrual cramps, and different reasons. Um, so it's one pill every day at the same time. Um, it is important to take it at the same time. Um, birth control pills, as well as Depo, are about 97 to 98% effective in general if taken appropriately. Um, most contraceptives, depending on when you start it and what type of contraceptives, will take two weeks to kick in. So it's super important when you start a new birth control that you know when it is effective. Um, so it's one pill at the same time every day, regardless of sexual activity. Um, you can see most of the pills will cycle you. So like in this pill pack, you see that the last row is a different color, generally in all the birth controls, generally not in all of them. So in most birth controls, um, your last week will be your period. Does it mean that on the first day that you see that brown pill or red pill um, that you're gonna have a period? It just means sometime during that week, you should have your period. And then even if you're on your period the next week, um, you'll start your, your, when it's time, you'll just start your new packet. You don't have to wait. It's one pill every day at the same time. Another um, method is the birth control patch. Um, so this is a patch that you're gonna apply weekly. So you're going to change it every week. We kind of encourage you to rotate it. So in the picture you see, um, she puts it on her belly in the front. So this time she has it on her right. This week she has it on her right. Next week she'll have it on her left. The following week she'll have it on her backside on her left. And then we ask, we usually recommend that you replace it or place it on a different site every week. You get one patch, you're gonna get, you're gonna apply one patch weekly. You're gonna apply it the next week. You're gonna remove it and put a new one for three weeks. On your fourth week, similar to the pills, on your fourth week, you're patch free. You do not put a patch on. And that's when your period comes. And then when it's time to put the new one, you put the new one. So let's say you chose a Monday to start your patch. So every Monday, you're gonna change it for the next three weeks. On the fourth week, when you take it off, you're just going to leave it off and you're not going to put anything. And then the following Monday, you'll start again. The contraceptive ring. So um, it used to be formally called NuvaRing. I think there's a generic version. There might be a generic version. I believe there is now. Um, so this ring is a ring that you insert into the vagina. For those that are used to wearing tampons, this is pretty easy. 
And then like you see in the diagram, you kind of bend it and just push it in. It stays in there because it pops open. So it stays inside the vagina. Um, if, if it isn't inserted pro appropriately, you're going to feel it in the vaginal canal. So there's usually no, you don't have to worry if I inserted it correctly. If you feel it, you probably just have to push it in a little bit more. This birth control ring stays in for three weeks. Um, and the, uh, when it's after the three weeks, after the 21 days, you're going to remove it and toss it. Um, it stays out for a week and then you insert a new one again. Similar to the pill and to the patch, it cycles you. If you can see that pattern of 21 days, seven days with nothing, and this is just to keep you on a normal pattern, a normal menstrual cycle. Um, it is considered a low dose contraceptive. So, you know, a lot of the side effects are minimal. Um, one of the, I live out in the desert. So one of the things I do tell my patients is it cannot be in the heat. So out here in the desert, we can't leave this on a counter. It has to be refrigerated because if there's no good air conditioner, if the air conditioner goes off, then, you know, it starts to release the hormones. So definitely make sure um, you read the instructions as far as how to um, uh, store it, it when it's when you haven't started to use it. If you get usually um, you get three at a time from the pharmacy, depending on your provider, or your prescription. So definitely read the insert for storage instructions for this ring. Barrier methods. So what we call barrier methods are like condoms. Um, there is not, um, the female condom and the male condom. This is the only method, birth control method, that prevents sexually transmitted diseases. None of the other methods will help prevent any sexually transmitted disease. While all the other methods pre help prevent pregnancy, it is still important for you to use a condom. Um, these are available at any local pharmacy, um, any grocery store, you know, any CVS, Walgreens. Um, it is super important to understand that when using a condom, it's often misused. It's used when um, the, the male is soon to ejaculate and that is not um, the appropriate way to use it. It's important to know how to apply the condom. So read the instructions. If you or your partner have never used it, make sure to read the instructions that it is applied or put on appropriately and it must be um, put on before any penetration occurs. Otherwise, there's always the risk of pre-ejaculation, um, which can lead to pregnancy. Um, so it's always important to read the instructions for the first time that you're using it, or if you're using a different type, to go ahead and read those um, um, instructions on how to put it on appropriately. Another barrier method that not a lot of people use, however, I still have um, some patients use once in a while, are the diaphragms and the cervical caps. Diaphragm, as you can see in the diagram, it's fairly large. It covers the entrance of the, of the cervix. They're used what you do. You see how it's a little hollow. If you see the picture um, to the left, you fill it with spermicides. You kind of bend it and then you put it in. It has to be fully um, inserted um, to, um, to cover the cervix, right? Um, cervical caps are slightly smaller, but same concept. You fill it up and you put it to the cervix. So a lot of teenagers are not generally well aware of their anatomy. Um, so this one may take a little bit of trial and error in inserting. Um, you have to, once um, you fill it in with the spermicide, you apply it. It also, they will give you instructions as far as how long to leave it, how to care for it, how to clean it. It is prescribed. So we do have to fit you. We have to make sure that it's the right size um, for your body type and that it'll fit appropriately. And then we tell you, we give you instructions on cleaning and storing of the diaphragms or the cervical caps. And spermicides. Spermicides, there's several types. As you can see, there's 
um, you know, there's foam, there's films, there's sponges, there's gels, there's creams, jellies. Um, a lot of the condoms also have some type of spermicide in them. So again, they're not as effective. You can buy them, generally you can buy these at any uh, grocery store or, or pharmacy. Make sure to read the instructions on appropriate use. Um, but I still encourage you to use a backup method and not to use it alone. So um, you still want to use it if you're not, you know, going to use uh, with condoms or something else because they're not as effective as other forms of birth control. And fertility awareness. So fertility awareness um, takes a little more dedication than most of the other contraceptives. It takes you a few months to find out um, your true cycles. And, and, and it might be a little bit difficult as, as a teenager, just because our menstrual cycles do tend to fluctuate, not in all teens, but in a lot of teens. A lot of teens do have irregular menstruation. So it can be a little bit more difficult to identify when you are most fertile. As you can see, fertility awareness, when you're ovulating, takes temperature. There's a lot of period apps out there that help you track your periods, tell you when you're most fertile. Uh, it usually takes you a good six months of documenting to see what your normal cycles are or your average cycles are. So there are a lot of methods for you to, um, a lot of apps or, you know, um, there's uh, also um, pages you can download if you want to do it like in this book to track. However, it does take some time and dedication. And I would always recommend that if this is the route you're going, definitely make sure you're using condoms with spermicides um, while you establish what your fertility pattern is to avoid pregnancy. Now, effectiveness, there's always what is most effective and what is least effective. Um, so we can start at the bottom with what's least effective. Withdrawal, um, many people call it pull-out method. Um, remember with withdrawal, there's always pre-ejaculation. So a lot of people are unaware that um, before ejaculation, there is also pre-ejaculation. So that's usually why we get pregnant um, using this method. The fertility awareness again, because most women don't have a regular cycle. Um, most of us have slightly regular cycles, so we are not quite sure when we get, when we are truly ovulating. So it may take some time to use that method and just to understand our cycles and then spermicides alone um, they're not as effective. They're usually used in combination with something else to make them more effective. So the next um, row up is uh, your barrier methods. So we talked about diaphragms, condoms, the sponge, the cervical caps. These sh should be used with spermicides. However, they're also about 78 to, so 20%, two out of 10 women will get pregnant using these methods, even if used correctly. Of course, if they're used incorrectly, your, your chances of pregnancy will increase. The next are the pills, patches, shot, um, and the ring. Um, these are about, um, in general, about 97% effective. They must be used appropriately. So when we're talking about appropriate use, the pill, in order for it to be about 97% effective, um, you know, when these studies are done, it's, they have a controlled group. So these people are taking, or these women are taking the pill every day at the same time. So it must be taken at the same time every day. So if you choose 8 p.m., 8 p.m., you know, if you choose to use the ring, you're going to take it off every time, every Monday or or whatever day of the week you selected, and you're going to insert the new, um, you're going to remove it and insert the, the new one when you're supposed to. You're not going to miss a day, you're not going to miss two days, or be late on inserting it. So it does, you do have to make sure that you're using it appropriately to have this effectiveness. 
um, the patch as well. Um, the patch does have some weight limitations, I should say, um, because it is absorbed through the skin. So that one's important for you to talk to your provider about and make sure that that is appropriate and if that's something you can use. Again, the shot, even if you go in, it's nothing is 100%, no method is 100% except abstinence. 99% are the four IUDs we talked about in the implant sterilization. You're too young to get sterilized, so we won't discuss that. Um, however, the implant and the IUDs are all above 99% effective. While they're not 100% effective, they're fairly effective. Next, I'm gonna review um, emergency contraceptive. Um, uh, there's two methods of emergency contraceptive. Most people are familiarized with the morning after pill or the pill after you know unprotected intercourse, but the Paragard copper IUD is actually also an emergency contraceptive. So we'll just talk a little bit about some of the myths surrounding emergency contraceptives. Um, some people think it causes abortions. The emergency contraceptives does not cause any abortions. It is, it's not true that it only works the morning after. Ideally, the sooner the better. You want to take it as soon as you have unprotected intercourse. The more you wait, the longer it will take. Um, and the different brands vary as to how many days later you can take them. Um, there's only one type of emergency contraceptive. As we talked about it, there's actually two different types of oral or two types of pills. And then there's the one IUD, the Paragard or the copper IUD, the non-hormonal. You, you do not need a prescription for your doctor to get the pills over the counter. They're sold over the counter. You can go to any pharmacy and purchase these. Um, another um, myth is that people believe that emergency contraceptive is always effective or it's 100% effective. Unfortunately, it is not 100% um, effective. However, it's better than no method at all. Um, it is most effective if taken within 12 to 24 hours. However, the longer you wait to take it, the less effective it will be. Um, uh, another, I'm sorry, another myth is that you're protected for the rest of your cycle. And that is incorrect. You are only protected for the day that you took um, the emergency contraceptive. So if you have sex again before your next period, you do run the risk of getting pregnant at, at that subsequent intercourse. Um, will it still work after you vomit? So um, emergency contraceptive is a high dose um, hormone. So some women will get nausea and vomiting or feel a little bit dizzy because we are giving you a high dose of hormone. So some women, will vomit after taking emergency contraceptive. If you vomit within the three hours, you do have to, you won't need another dose. However, you want to contact um, a provider to discuss it and make sure that you do need another dose. Um, emergency contraceptive does not increase the risk of infertility or your or threaten your ability to get pregnant. It, um, no study has demonstrated any long-term effects on fertility or on your ability to get pregnant. Another myth is that it increases your risk of an ectopic pregnancy. And it, ectopic pregnancy is a pregnancy that um, doesn't develop in the uterus, but rather it develops or it, it implants in your fallopian tube. So that is incorrect. There's no evidence or studies um, confirming that um, emergency contraceptive will increase your risk of ectopic pregnancies except for um, IUD, but that's not emergency contraceptive pills.
Um, so here are uh, what works best, what works less. So the most effective contra emergency contraceptive method is that Paracard IUD. It is about 99% effective if, if inserted within the five days. Um, that you have to go to a healthcare provider. It is a procedure that we do in the office. The next effective is Ella, um, and that's the brand. Um, if you take it as soon as possible, again, the longer you take to take it, the less effective it will be. And you can use that pill up to five days after unprotected intercourse. Um, plan B, which is probably the one that people know a little bit more, have heard more about just because it's been on the market a little bit longer. It only works up to three days. So you should only be taking it up to three days. If it's been longer than that, then you probably need the alternative. Again, with emergency contraceptive, the sooner you take it or you get into your provider's office, the better. And the most effective, like I said, was the IUD and ALA. Um, how does the IUD work as an emergency contraceptive? It should be inserted within five days. It, what it does is it decreases the sperm's ability to fertilize the egg. And it can also, after that, it can also stay in and it can be there for as long as 10 years. It is important to note though, um, that just because an IUD or your implant is um, good for 10, three years, you do not have to leave it in there that long. Um, let's say you got a Paragard IUD when you were 18 and then you know you get married and decide to have a baby at 23. It hasn't been 10 years. That's perfectly fine. You can remove it at any time. It does not have to stay there for the length of the device or the life of the device. When you're ready to get it out, that's perfectly okay. You do not have to keep it for that long. Long-term contraceptives, depending on it, we usually, of course, want you to at least keep it a year. However, if anything, there's any side effects, we will remove it sooner than that. It doesn't have to stay in. And then how does emergency contraceptive pill work? It, it delays ovulation. Um, and this goes back to um, a little bit if, if it causes um, an abortion, it does not. So let's say you, um, you are, had already ovulated the day that you had intercourse and you happened to get pregnant that same night and you took your emergency contraceptive three or five days later, it is not going to cause you to abort if you're already pregnant. It's not going to do that. So if you ovulated already, you ovulated. But if you haven't and you're around that time of ovulation, it will help stop the ovulation. And how much does emergency contraceptive cost? Um, emergency contraceptive is covered by most insurance plans. There's also the family pack program, which is a lot of people know it, the green card. Um, it's, a fam it's a pregnancy prevention program that covers most birth control. Um, it is uh, confidential. Oh, there's a lot of um, facilities that offer it. And um, you can use this as a method to, to obtain emergency contraceptive. It does require a prescription. So if, you know, it's a Saturday, the doctor's office isn't open, you don't have anywhere, um, you can find emergency contraceptive anywhere from $12 to $50 is the general range. You know, you can go to Walmart, Target, pharmacy. Um, it, it, you do have to go to a pharmacy to obtain it, though. So you do have to go to the pharmacist. It's not on the shelf. You'll go to the pharmacist and you can look around. You can look around online. Um, the, the cheapest one I found was $12. Um, and IUD, again, the intrauterine device is covered by most insurance plans and, and including the family pack program or the green card. And for you to find a provider, um, we listed a few 
um, Borrego Community Health Foundation is um, the organization I work for, we're a federally qualified health center. We do offer assistance with the family packed um, application. We have staff at every clinical site to assist you in applying and give you your card. And we have providers that can also provide these services. Um, there's some information on Family Pact. You can look, go to that website and look for a, or search a provider near you. And Planned Parenthood is also available. They also work with the Family Pact program and they will assist you as well with any emergency contraceptive or birth control that you like. Um, and we will, um, we will talk a little bit about Title X. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna go ahead and show everyone how you're supposed to um, locate a health clinic, um, a Title 10 health clinic is really what it is. So if you click on this link right here, it's gonna take you to this uh, website right here. This is what you're gonna see. So right here it says enter a street address city or zip code, just enter um, whichever one that you are familiar with. So I'm gonna go ahead and enter one as an example, Preservation Park. Uh, I'm gonna click on this one. Next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna click on this um, basically uh, magnifying glass icon. It's in orange, you're gonna click that and then this is what pops up. So the way you look at this is you're looking at the map on the right hand side right here. You should be the one uh, in red basically. And then the location of the Title 10 Health Clinic, you can find them in like the blue raindrop like icon right here. These three are like the closest one um, to where I am at the moment. And so if this is for you, if you are much more of a visual person, let's say you're more of a numbers person, you wanna see which one's the closest distance to you and go um, see if they have any of the services that you want, right? And so right here, it gives you right here, this one says it's six miles away, this one's seven miles away, so on and so forth. You can always adjust this one up here as well. If you wanna go closer, or you're willing to go further, uh, whichever one uh, is most convenient for you. And if you go, you scroll up a little bit more, you see this right here, it says, please call to ensure your clinic is open. We always wanna make sure we're making the most use of our time, right? We don't wanna go there just to find out, oh, the clinic is closed or anything like that. So they do provide you a number right here. You can call their office and then I'll tell you, um, whoever the person is on the phone, they'll tell you if they're open or not and that'll give you a better idea. But also if you were to click on view details right here, let's say I click on that. Um, this is what pops up. It gives me the name of the health clinic. It tells me what services are offered at this specific health clinic and the hours of operation. So I know right off you know, hand that Tuesday, Friday to Sunday, they don't open. They're only in operations uh, for three days a week. And so I would want to go to this health clinic um, during those three days. And I can always call to make sure that they're open if I need an appointment, things like that. Um, and here's the physical address again phone number again, and then let's say you see the service that you want and it's being offered in this specific health clinic. You can always get the directions by clicking it right here. It'll pop up into a different tab for you and you're in Google Maps already. If you did this on your laptop or computer or tablet, you can always send it to your phone, the directions, or you can see the directions here yourself. But generally that's how you use the Title 10 health clinic locator that we were talking about. And then I'm gonna go back over here. Remember, I did say at the beginning of the uh, webinar that the slides will be emailed to you. So once you get the slide, you can just go to like the third, the third to last um, slide, and then you can just click on this and then it'll take you to that website, um, website where I went right away, basically. And so that's it on our end. We're gonna open up to questions. If you have any, please feel free to put it um, in the group chat or to the host and panelists if you haven't done so already. I'm just gonna go ahead and check right now. And I think during um, the presentation, I did see someone raise their hand. So if that person, um, you know who you are, if you have that question still, please feel free to put it in the group chat for us. Um, we'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Let's see. I also wanted to say um, before 
I, um, we also finish every birth control um, has risk factors and benefits. So it is important to make sure you discuss any risk factors, your provider based on your risk factors will tell you what birth control is suitable for you and which one may not be as suitable. So definitely make sure to talk to a provider regarding um, the risks and the benefits of the birth control that you select. Thank you for that um, information. So we have a question here. Um, is it okay to not have your period every month? So it is okay. So I guess this is kind of a complicated question. Um, we don't have to get our period every month if it's, so sometimes we use birth control that stop our periods. So in that case, it is normal for you not to have a period. However, if just in general, you know, you had a period at 13 and you haven't had one and now you're 15, uh, yeah, definitely go to the doctor. But if you're on birth control and that prevents your, um, that stopping your period makes it shorter, lighter, that's just a side effect of the birth control. And there is no problem with that occurring. A lot of people like, um, I know one common myth of the Depo-Provera injection, that I've heard a lot is because uh, some people gain weight and they're like, I gain weight because it stays in me. My period stays in me. Um, and that is incorrect. Your, your period or the bleeding does not. It's the lining of the uterus that we shed. Um, our bodies get, our women, our bodies get um, prepared for pregnancy every month. And if we don't get pregnant, then we shed and we, it's a cycle. So um, what the birth control is doing is stopping your body from, you know, from preparing for pregnancy. So in some women, you won't have a period and others you'll have very light. So there is no harm in not having a period if it's um, secondary to your birth control. Awesome. Thank you for that. And we have another question. Is the patch covered by medical or Medi-Cal? There you go. The patch should be covered by Medi-Cal. However, if it's straight Medi-Cal, um, some people have um, like IHP, Molina, other um, insurances um, attached to Medi-Cal. Um, they generally cover it. If it is not, uh, if it is straight Medi-Cal, it may not cover. However, Family Pack will cover anyone that is insured. Um, through Medi-Cal and Medi-Cal does not cover it, Family Pack will cover that for you. Thank you. And then another question. So if I wanted to use an IUD, how much would it usually cost? Again, in general, you should not be paying for an IUD, especially if you're a teen. It is free to you through the Family Pack program. Um, so you should not pay anything for that device. Thank you for that. Does anyone else have any questions, concerns they want to bring up? There we go, another one. Is there a period tracking app that you would recommend? I don't have one that I specifically recommend. In general, my teenagers, I have them select one, try it out, and um, you know, if they like it, some have a little bit more features than others. Um, however, select a free one. They're fairly easy, easy to use. I think the one I've used is, oh, it had a little flower, but I don't know, my period tracker, I think it was called. Um, I haven't opened it in a, in a while, but there's a lot. Just, you know, look around to see which one, look at the reviews to see what they say. Um, but there's so many free on Androids and Apple devices um, that you can use. And then another question just came in. What may the effects be while on the IOD? Like, for example, weight loss. Is there any other um, effects to it? Side effects. So IUD side effects. So um, it, it depends on the IUD. So with Paragard, the non-hormonal, in general, if you have three to four day periods, expect like a four to five day period and expect it to be a little bit heavier flow than what you're used to. Um, I don't recommend Paragard IUD for anyone or the copper IUD or 10 year IUD for anyone that has heavy menstruation because this is gonna make your periods heavier and longer and you're gonna be unhappy. Um, 
cramping or um, is very common with the IUDs, um, with any of the IUDs. So you may have cramping even when you're not on your period. Not Usually it's not severe, nothing that Tylenol or Motrin couldn't help take care of. Um, as far as the IUDs in general, they, the biggest side effect is the changes in your period. So with the hormonal um, IUDs like Mirena, Kylene, or Skyla, um, your periods do become shorter, lighter. If you're the type that really wants a period, then you know that may not be the most beneficial method for you. If you don't mind not having a period, then those work great. They're effective. There's not much that you need to do. It is important though to discuss all the risk factors with your provider um, specifically. And then another one. These are great questions, you guys. Please keep it up. Um, how do you convince your parents to let you go on birth control? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, as a mother, <laughs> as a mother, my 20-year-old. Um, so it's interesting because I know that's a difficult conversation to have. My children probably have heard about birth control and STDs since, you know, they were in middle school. Um, something, you know, it's hard to discuss. And I know even with that um, open relationship, it was difficult for um, my daughter to have that discussion. So I definitely feel that sometimes it's hard to go to your parents and say, um, I want to get on birth control, or I think I need to be on birth control. Just to let you know, you do not, when it comes to birth control, you do not need parent permission to go into the clinic. However, um, I do highly encourage you to try and have that conversation with your parents um, so that they're aware and that you know you just have that open communication if you can. And if you can't, it is important to know that all your visits are confidential. Um, nothing's gonna be shared with your parents when you come in and you're seeking birth control. At that point, you don't need parent participation. But, you know, I always encourage you to try to have that conversation. It might be a little bit difficult, but it is important. And, you know, I have some parents that are, you know, she told me she wanted birth control. I brought her. I'm going to step out of the room. So it, you just don't know how your parents are going to respond. Um, but I know it is a difficult conversation to have sometimes. And then this was relating to the previous question about the side effects of the IUDs, but there might have been con some confusions, but they're asking if there's different types of IUDs, perhaps you can like give like a brief overview of the ones that um, you already talked about. Yes, there's different types. There's four types of IUDs. Um, so I'll start with Skyla. Skyla is a three-year IUD. Skyla and Kylina were actually manufactured or are targeted for um, the younger uh, population that have not had children. Um, so what they did is they made the IUD smaller and the applicator smaller. Um, and with that, there's less hormones as well. You know, as providers, we always wanna use the least amount of hormones that are equally effective. So not because it has less hormones means it's at um, it's less than effective. It's equally ineffective. However, depending on the reason why we're using it, we might need to use a, a higher dose. So Skyla is an IUD that is for three years, and Kylina is an IUD that's for five years. Kylina and Skyla almost have the same amount of hormones. Skyla, the three year has a little bit less, and then Kylina has a little bit more. Mirena is the is a now this just last year was approved for seven years, FDA approved, I should say, for seven years. So that one has a slightly, slightly more hormones and it's actually slightly bigger as well. However, all of the, all of those three hormonal IUDs are considered low dose. And then we have Paragard, which we call the copper IUD. And that one contains absolutely no hormones. And that one is good for up to 10 years. Thank you for that brief overview. Um, more questions on the way. Does the contraceptives help pre um, reduce period cramps? And if it does help, which would you recommend? So they do. Um, most of the contraceptive pills will help 
with period um, cramps. Um, IUDs don't necessarily help with period cramps. So you got to think about that one, just how severe there are. If they're mild, your cramping may go up a little bit more with the IUD. Um, but usually the pill is the most effective in reducing cramps. Of course, if we stop your periods with Depo or the Depo Provera injection, then you may not have cramps at all um, just because we're eliminating that period. However, some women, even if we stop the period, occasionally they still have the symptoms of their cycle or like their menses um, without the bleeding. So um, for the most part, the pill is usually the most effective with the cramping. However, we can also prescribe something um, to help you for cramps. So if you do have severe cramps, definitely let your parents know there is medication. We don't want you to suffer through that. And then I believe um, you had this uh, graphic inside the presentation, but what percentage is withdrawal effective? If you know at the top of your head. I don't, but it's in the 70s, I believe. It's, it's very low. And again, because remember when we talk about withdrawal or pull out, there's pre-ejaculation. So ejaculation is, you know, when your partner finishes or, you know, in plain terms, a lot of teens say when they come, right? So before this, there is um, there is what we call pre-ejaculation. So seminal fluid or, or semen is released prior to ejaculation. So remember with semen, there's a lot of semen um, released. It's not like one or two. So that's why a withdrawal method is not as effective because they cannot feel the pre-ejaculation to withdraw during that time. Thank you for that. And then we have um, another one. Let's say I was on an IUD and I was having really bad cramps. Can I take medicine to stop the cramping? Yes, um, there is medication. The most effective medication generally um, tends to be anti-inflammatory uh, medication. Some of the medication is um, over-the-counter, such as you know Motrin, ibuprofen, Advil, those tend to be quite a bit more effective than like your regular Tylenol. However, if you do have an IUD in and you're having cramping, just follow up. Um, if it's more intense, just follow up with your provider. We want to make sure IUD is in the correct place and that it's just, you know, um, an increase in cramping, which we do expect. However, definitely follow up with your provider if you feel that they've worsened with the IUD. Thank you for that. 